Toward the end of the 20th century, there lived a man whom many believed provided answers to humanity's problems. But some people thought otherwise. They viewed him as a threat to law and order, a threat to society itself. His name was Prabhat Ranjan Sarkar, also known as Shri Shri Anandamurti, the embodiment of bliss, or more simply, Baba, Father. I was as a universal family. Each and every entity helps others in maintaining not only the equilibrium but also the equipoise of the entire universe, not only of this small planet Earth. From childhood, I always knew that I wanted to learn meditation. I wanted to practice meditation. I wasn't 100% clear on what it is, but I did know that meditation involves a guru. That's what I was looking for, meditation, perfection, and my link with God. Somebody asked me why I came to Ananda Marga, and I say, I can't tell because it's just like somebody is calling me, you know, so it's, it's like a calling, you know, that I just have to go and do it. I knew from the very beginning that this guru is something special. I met Baba physically, it was 1977. I actually, I didn't know what to ask him because, you know, he's my guru, he's my master and I felt very awed in his presence. And I was happy just, just to be there and to feel the peace. When I was very young, in my young stage, I used to look Baba as an uncle. As time passed, I came to know Baba much more deeply. And then I came to know that he is not my uncle. He is really Baba, supreme power. You see, when I was a student, then I joined Marga and dedicated my life in the year 1957. My first experience is that here is a man, gentleman, guru, who loves us so much. Tears were rolling down from my eyes. So whenever Baba used to say something, do you understand my boy? I said, yes, sir. Then Baba said, I am not sir, I am Baba. This was very pleasant to me. I am not sir, I am a Baba. Baba was born on a full moon day just at sunrise in Jamalpur, India. The year was 1921. From childhood, he was highly charismatic. He attracted all types of followers and friends. And in his personal life, he was very disciplined. Baba's family, they were not only very noble, but very disciplined family. Hmm. Baba was so much disciplined, even in the latter period of his life, when he became 50 years or 45 years of age. He used to seek permission from his mother when he would go somewhere for even another mark work. From the childhood onwards, he had talked some miraculous stories to their friends and they used to get puzzled. So when he will talk to the friends, he will be just like a friend. Uh -huh. But sometimes to some of his friends, he would show some miracles. They used to go to the polo ground and every day they observed that Baba mysteriously disappears. So they wanted, they were curious to know what was actually happening. One day, they, some two, three of them decided that we will watch, keep a watch on him. 
and look uh, see find out where he is disappearing to then uh, that day as they started playing suddenly baba was gone then but they were alert about that so immediately they started looking for him he was walking away at a distance toward the that valley so they also followed him at some distance the three of those boys they saw him entering that valley those days death valley was considered to be a very dangerous place there were wild animals and also there were a lot of stories about ghosts uh, haunting that area so after uh, about an hour or so they saw something very was very sh- shocking and frightening for them he was riding on a tiger he got down and patted the tiger it went away they went to bawa's house and they to- informed bawa's mother about it then she was also surprised hey, what nonsense you are talking my son riding on tiger then uh, the, the mother called baba she said bubu what is it they are telling that you were riding on tiger he said baba ma do you believe this <laughs> they, are, they pick it up a quarrel with me today and that's why they are making up all these stories it is certainly a case of miracle he is really near to the god he is not near to the god he is god himself like shiva and krishna Rumors were already abounding about who he was and what he might do and there were followers of one religion who had heard that he would put an end to that religion. They were fanatic and they caught Baba when he was moving in an isolated lonely place. They put a an old tire around him and set the tire alight. The humanity is now at the threshold of a new era. We don't want any dogma. You slogan should be dogma no more, dogma no more. Baba fell unconscious, his intestines burst out. And when Baba came back to consciousness, naturally he was in great pain. but it was at that point when he had to make a decision shall i keep this physical body or shall i give it up and take another one baba decided as the story goes that if i give up this body then my whole mission will be delayed by 18 years he's already 18 years old and so instead he took his intestines piled them back into his belly held on to it and walked down to the hospital where he was operated on where he bore a scar from that incident throughout the rest of his life he is the person really he knows each and everything of each and every Hindu, human beings of this world he was a civilian person but when i came near to him i found that he is all knowing person He was knowing everything about my life. He looked like an ordinary man. He was just wearing simple plain white clothes and uh, very clean uh, shaved. And he uh, asked me to come closer. Mm-hmm. And then he said, you have done many wrong things in your life. And I said, I don't think so. So he says, oh, so you have forgotten what you have done. I was not sure if he really knew what I had done or he was just guessing because everybody does, you know, some things. And he said, uh, should you not get punishment for what you did uh, he took out the stick it was uh, this long bamboo stick and he says where should i punish you i said baba here i was not afraid of him and he says why here i said because from here i have done all the wrong and one should not be afraid of god one should not be god fearing one must be god loving one should not be afraid of hell and one must not have any charm or fascination for the so called heaven one must know that one has come from that supreme progenitor and one's culminating point of all sorts of marches all sorts of movements is that supreme father everything cometh from him and goeth back to him the relationship is that of love and affection and not of any fear complex one must not say oh god i am a sinner 
you need not say like this. It is superfluous to say like this because whatever you did is known to him. Then what's the necessity of saying, oh God, I am a sinner? He knows everything. You need not remind him that you are a sinner. <laughs> so he brought the stick with full force as if he was going to break my head into two pieces. And very gently he touched it at this plexus. And, uh, and then he took a promise from me that, you know, I'll be an ideal human being. Baba was just 18 when he accepted his first disciple. Then Baba was a student of intermediate science in Calcutta. The year was 1939. It was a full moon night and Baba was walking along the, the river bank of the Bhagirati River. Baba went and sat there. For other persons, that place was dreadful. At one pier along the river, he was accosted by a fearsome robber named Kalicharan Bandopajai. This thief had a, a reputation for taking everything that his victims possessed and leaving them dead behind. He saw that this young boy sitting here and he shouted, You young boy, you're sitting here? Whatever you have in your pocket and give it to me. But Baba spoke to him in such an endearing and even fatherly fashion that Kali Charan was completely shocked. He called him by his name. Hmm. Kali Charan, what for you are doing all these things? Why should you rob people? Then he said, it is because of, that is my livelihood. I do it for my livelihood. Baba said, I want to change your life. Yes. You come to me. You sit before me. Uh -huh. Then he asked, what are you going to do to me? Uh -huh. I said, I will give you spiritual teaching. No, 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 no. I can't do like, uh, take, take up spirituality uh, in the, this dirty body. So he jumped into the river. He took bath and came out and sat before Baba. Then Baba started giving him initiation. After doing that, he said, sit in meditation. When he closed his eyes, Baba touched his forehead like this. Yes. And he went into Samadhi, the trance, the highest state of his spirituality. He felt that he has become divine. He felt that he has become infinite. He felt that this is the highest bliss that one can have in this life. Hmm. So he started, uh, he started in, a, in a way, he started dancing. Then again, he sat down before Baba, he touched his feet, he said, you have changed my life. Then Baba said, okay, now your name is also changed. You are Kali Charan, now your name is Kali Kanand. From now onward, you should not do this sort of work. His father worked in the, library, in the railway department awesome. as an accountant. Mm -hmm. And after his death, he got, Baba also got the same post. He naturally had so many family duties. He had to take care of his younger brothers. His mother uh, was getting older. He was earning some money. And whatever money he used to earn, he used to hand over that to his mother. He didn't keep a single rupee with him. Wherever Baba went, whatever he did, he always stood out. Some people thought he was a palm reader and he had unbelievable knowledge, incredible knowledge about people just by seeing their palms. And some people thought he was an astrologer. Everybody, when they were in difficulty, would come to him and ask him for advice. One day his boss came to him. He was worried about his wife, who was at that time in England, and in the hospital, facing what some doctors said was a, a very serious operation. But Baba said to his boss, no, 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 it's not so complicated. She's okay, and in a, in, in a week or two, she will be fully recovered and she will come back. Sure enough, a couple weeks later, his boss came to Baba and introduced him to his wife. 
not Baba's wife, his boss's wife, who had just returned from England. His wife was shocked. She said, but how can you be here? And her husband didn't know what she was talking about and Baba was just smiling. She told her husband that, you know, when I was in the hospital in England, they wanted to do a very serious operation on me. But this man, he came into the room as a doctor in the hospital and he told them that no, no, no. She doesn't need that operation at all. It's a simple problem and we'll treat it in this fashion. And due to him, I recovered quickly and was able to come home soon. He is a person who is so miraculous that he can be here at this moment and the same moment he can be anywhere else, anywhere in the world. At one time, he Baba told me that many a time I had to take 20, 25 bodies at the same time for some doing some help to others. While Baba was in Jamalpur, gradually he started to accumulate more and more disciples, people who learned meditation directly from him, from Baba himself, or through individuals whom Baba had trained as his acharyas, his teachers, people who taught the meditation on his behalf. This was happening largely due to word of mouth. She wants to know what is the meaning of this abstract, the term abstract, abstract is a philosophy. You see, the Buddha spoke about that, that says, there are subtleties that we can see or feel certain inferences coming within the jurisdiction of sensory or motor organs. They are called material. But there are certain things that we can feel within. The boy I can see, but the good I cannot see. The good we cannot touch. What's your name? Kusimita. If I say Kusimita is a very naughty guy. I'm not saying that Kusimita is a very naughty guy. Then that naughty cannot be seen. Kusimita is something material. But the naughty is not something material. But I feel that she is naughty girl. She never said, Baba, I have prepared this uh, food for you. Hmm? So she is a naughty girl. But that naughty or naughtiness cannot be seen, cannot be touched. You follow? And that thing is absolutely. A guru of his caliber doesn't come and teach meditation to a small group of people, ten people, a hundred people, a thousand people. A guru like this comes to uplift everyone. And for that purpose, an organization was essential. One of the first stories I heard about Baba after taking initiation dates back to 1954, 1955, just before Baba created his organization. As the story goes, Baba had summoned his disciples and with a grave voice told them that he would be leaving his body later that day. As a going away gift, he would grant their any wish. Everyone was distressed. One Margi, I believe it was Acharya Nagina, he grabbed Baba's feet and said that his wish was that Baba would remain with them for another 50 years. Baba kept silent for a moment, and then he said, Tatastu, so be it. This story became so prevalent, it gained so much traction in Ananda Marga that everyone was certain that Baba would remain alive until the year 2005. The math was simple. 
1955 plus 50. But now it seems there was much more to this story than met the eye. To bring a revolution in the world, you need a lot of discipline. You need strong discipline. And Ananda Marga is that. In the past, no spiritual master ever built an organization. An organization would develop after he was gone by followers and disciples. Baba himself, from the year 1955 till 1990, built an organization. It's one of his great achievements. And it's a global organization. And the most interesting part of it is it became global. It spread around the world while he was in jail. <laughs> Marjee's workers, they used to come to Baba for reporting. Baba used to take the reporting of the mission of Ananda Marga. Baba has already made the planning. You know, the, he has divided this entire globe into nine sectors. And all sectors have been divided into re different regions. And all regions have been divided into, di into different dioceses, districts, blocks, panchayats, villages. He has given the planning for the new world, for the entire world up to village level. This is Anandanagar. We were in central Anandanagar, but it extends how far? Mm. And more important, how did we actually get this land? Oh, long back in 1961, Baba decided that there should be a, some good chunk of land in some rural areas where tribals are living and we would like to serve them with, uh, uh, with their education and, uh, and uh, for, for their economic development. So it was decided that we should come over here. Mm -hmm. Some representatives were sent there to locate the land and to know who is the owner of these lands. Then we could know that there is one uh, Raja, king, mm -hmm. old, uh, now then it was, he was not a Raja, he was not a king, because the kingdom was already invested in the government, but still he had a very big uh, chunk of land in his possession. It is, Garjaipur is, a, is about uh, maybe 20 kilometers away from here. So our representative met him and he was, uh, when he heard that we are going to do some social service here, he became very happy and uh, he offered that he will give 500 big house of land. That means about, uh, maybe about 200 acres of land over here, free of cost. So he got it registered in the name of Anandamar Prasarak Sangh in 1961, at the, in the end of 1961. Slowly, we developed schools and colleges and uh, hospital and other social service projects were taken up here. Some workers were deputed here. So like that it, is, it grew and nowadays we find that hundreds and hundreds and thousands of villagers, they have become educated. The degree college though, that was put under the uh, guidance of Acharya Swarup Manji, no? Yes. So where Baba's house is, where our central yes, office yes, is, yes. even where our pandal is, where Baba gave DMC, yes. it's all given by that Raja. So like that, Anandagar started growing and growing and growing. Now it has become a very big project mm -hmm. already. And we have already uh, served a lot. Do you recall when Baba actually declared Anandagar to be our central office, our central... You know, yes. the, the moment this this land was registered, he declared that this will be our central office, mm -hmm. central uh, center of Anandabar. That will be the center of Anandabar. I see. And all of these buildings, the location of them, the streets, everything, how did that come about? You no, know, in the beginning, it was just like as we see here around. Yeah. Of course. This street here, that street there, even the names of the yes, streets. Yes, he gave the whole outline of it. And uh, which uh, project will be in which place, all these things, details he gave. But uh, minute details we have to develop, we have to be able to make out. During that period, you know, we came to Anandagar, we established Anandagar in 1962, 61, 62 and onward. 
565-66. We were very much popular here. So they attempted to crush us by any means. This would become our global headquarters, and he named the place Ananda Nagar. When we moved there, the communist-led government of West Bengal, the CPIM, Communist Party of India, Marxist, who had always been opposed to Ananda Marga, largely because of Prout, felt threatened. On March 5th of 1967, they stirred up the local people, the villagers, to attack Baba and those workers and Margis who were present at the time. We lost five good men that day. Finally, they surrounded Baba's house. They were all around us with rifles, spears, bows and arrows, and in reply we had nothing to offer. We had no weapons. So Baba instructed one Avadhuta. He was the second Avadhuta that was made by Baba. He told me this story personally. Baba instructed him, go out, pick up a stone and throw it at the attackers. And he did just that. He rushed out, grabbed a stone, and threw it at the, the attackers, and surprisingly, they turned around and left. To this day, March 5th is remembered as our day of, we don't use the word martyr, we use the word dadici. It signifies those who have sacrificed their life for the mission. I met Ananda Marga immediately after uh, one month, I just joined the uh, training and then I went to volunteer in different countries in, in Venezuela. That was two years and after that I decided to become a charia. So I went to Sweden training center for four years, three years. And after that I got my first posting in South Korea. You are one of the very first workers of Ananda Marga to go outside of India. Yes. That was in 69, yes? 69, yeah. In Philippines it was, first time. Yeah. So, did he give you any special instructions, do this or do that? Then I was expecting that Baba will call me and explain me how it's Philippines, what is the culture, how should I behave, how, what should I do there. Mm -hmm. So Baba called me and told me, remember, MCT. MCT. And then he said, M means misunderstanding. C means Kunanan. Kunanan. Kunanan was the name of a Margi there in Manila. Okay. And T means tactics. Tact. Tact. Tactfulness. Okay. And he said, you can go now. <laughs> I, I don't know anything. What will I do? I was lost. But anyway, <clears throat> it is the instruction of Baba, so I had to go. There's a Margi called Kunanan. Kunanan. And he was always helping me. And he was helping me do prasad. He will go night lectures, you know, he will assist me in the lectures and uh, he will publish books and all that. But one day what happened was, he was publishing a monthly magazine called Elementary Yoga. Uh -huh. And he will send some copies of that to the center. But in that Elementary Yoga, he will pull most of the things from other yoga books, not from other mm -hmm. So one day he got a letter that your magazine does not reflect Anamarga ideology, Anamarga philosophy. He got hurt. You know, Filipinos are very sentimental. Mm. And from that time, he stopped pu publishing the magazine and slowly we became distant. And then, he became anti-Marga, anti, anti Marga. So that's what Baba said, Kunan, I have to be careful with him. Ah, okay. So this is the story of MCT. Baba Namo Ke Balamo Baba Baba Namo Ke Balamo Everything is within you because the Paramapurusa always remains within, within the very food of your soul. So search within, O oh, the spiritual aspirant, not without but within, within your very existence. I think there are many angles to why Baba created Anandamarga Pracharka Sangha in 
1955-1 was that a guru of his caliber doesn't come and teach meditation to a small group of people, 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people. A guru like this comes to uplift everyone, not just his own followers, but also those who aren't his followers, to transform the world. And for that purpose, an organization was essential. I think the main transition that took place, though, when Baba first created Ananda Marga Pracharika Sangha, and I might be wrong about this, but as I understood, it was at that point in time that Baba left his work as a accountant in the railway administration and became the president of the organization and hence expected to have his basic economic needs met by the organization. He became a full-time employee of the organization as a accountant in the railway administration he would go to work every day and seven, eight hours or ten hours or however long he had in his work day were essentially dedicated to activity that had, we can say, limited universal value. It might have been of value to the uh, Indian railways, but uh, it wasn't necessarily of great value to me living in Europe, the United States, Africa, or Asia. And so the creation of an organization allowed Baba to give more of his time to the activities of transforming the world. When Baba first created the organization, there were many followers uh, in Jamalpur, but they were all householders, and they were all engaged in their uh, their usual activities. There were also followers from other parts of India already, others were coming, but the numbers were relatively small. The creation of an organization, Baba's dedication of his full time to the building of that organization and the propagation of Ananda Marga and subsequently of other things besides Ananda Marga like progressive utilization theory, Prout, neo-humanism, uh, and finally, of course, the Prabhat Sangeet. Uh, that was all enabled by the creation of the organization in 1955. I hesitate to say what the reason was for Baba doing anything at all. Sitting in one room, he knows all the, all the plannings, Baba is to give all the plannings to the entire world. Service in the field of yoga is not the same as in commercial sphere. In commercial sphere, Shiva means mutual exchange. Give some money, take some part. It is, it is something mutual. You are giving something and you are receiving something. The shopkeepers give you some article and receive money in exchange. You give money and receive article in exchange. So this sort of service is mutual. But uh, in the field of spirituality, this seva is not mutual. It is unilateral. You are giving everything to Paramapurusa and in return you are taking nothing. But you know, when you give everything to you, even your very existence, then what does happen? You become one with Paramapurusa. So when you give him everything in exchange, you get the Paramapurusa. You get the Lord. So here you are not the loser. You are gainer of everything. This is the proper import of the term seva. 
it is unilateral and not mutual. The mission of Ananda Marga, the mission of Baba, I can say, is create a new society, a human society fully worthy of that name, a neo-humanist society which incorporates all beings, all living beings, not just human beings, but animals and plants, and even inanimate objects as one integrated universal family. Uh, those who are really devoted for his mission, for his service activities around the world, and keep himself busy in rendering human services to the suffering humanity of this world. You know, everybody must get fresh water, education, free education, free health, res uh, residence, communication, everything. That's why he gave the uh, proud, you know, the proud theory and all this. In 1965, it was, Pahimat was proclaimed. And now we will be celebrating 50 years Jubilee. And the headquarter of MRT is in Anandanagar. The purpose of MRT is to do service to the people affected by natural disasters and man-made calamities. This was the intention of Baba, to inspire the volunteers, to inspire the disciples, to inspire the Margi workers to render maximum service to the people affected by natural disasters. And we have been doing since past, since 65 till today. This year will be celebrated by Emert Golden Jubilee Celebration. So I feel now that he is always with me. By doing little service to the suffering people, he is smiling, and his, his smile keeps me satisfied. Yes, let me do some something to keep my Lord smiling. We used to go and give report to him about our work, and in, in so many ways he would always not only encourage, like, oh, you can do it, but, you know, he would ask us to do the impossible in a way, but in a way that... We had to say yes, we can do it. And when you say yes, 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 and keep on saying yes, then you, you can do it, you know? And you learn how to do it. You, you learn how to believe you can do the impossible and you learn to do the impossible. equal, that both are eligible for spiritual realization, for enlightenment or, you know, the highest spiritual states, that he didn't discriminate between men and women, which in a lot of traditional, uh, say, Indian practices or even Asian practices or even in the West, <laughs> there's a discrimination between sort of men and women's uh, spiritual practice and also their roles within the spiritual community. So Baba, first of all, emphasized many times that men and women spiritually are equal, even though we have differences on the physical and even the, the psychic levels due to our different glandular makeup. But the glands we use for spiritual practice are, are the highest glands in the human brain. And he said there is no difference between men and women at that level. Because of this also, he not only created an order of monks, but he created...
created an order of nuns. So that was one important aspect of Baba's kind of elevation of women in the society. And another was that Baba said society, in order for society to develop, there must be a coordinated cooperation between the male and the female sides of society and the qualities of both the male and the female must be utilized in equal measure. So for this, um, towards this aim, in 1965, Baba created a department in Anandamaga called Women's Welfare Department. And he specifically gave the du duty to the Didis, to the female Acharyas, to to develop and to run this women's welfare department. I even questioned Baba. He had written once that, you know, like, women are, like, better at home, you know? And I was like, oh, yeah? Since when? I mean, they should go to the moon, like this, you know? So um, then I asked him, that Baba, why you said like this? So he said, no, there's nothing. I'd never say that women can't, they can't can do any job, they can do anything but better in the home. And, and I was like, okay, I want intellectual reason, you know, I'm waiting for some intellectual reason. And he's, then he just said to me, when the baby cries, who does it want? And it just hit <laughs> the female part of me that when the baby cries, he wants his mother, doesn't want his mother off somewhere, he wants to be. So Baba said, women are better at home, but women are not second-class citizens. Women are equal. He said in, in Anandamar, you'll find in many religions that women don't have the same standard as the men. The men can be the, the priests or the pundits and the other thing. The women can't, you know. But in Anandamar, the women and the men are absolutely equal, spiritually equal. Baba said, if women have uh, education and economic independence, they will be able to take their rightful place as equal partners of their family. Due to their conditions, due to his growing attacks, there are different in color. A particular human being may have white coffee, may be a white coffee, someone black, someone very black, someone even though it is one of them in their difference. It is an external difference. And when we should be a, a special type of scripture, a uh, scripture based on these differences, no, there must not be any difference of color or any special disparity without difference of color. Now there is a sex difference. Females are demanded from many social lives, social political lives. They move. A few hundred years ago, they had no voting rights in many other countries of the world. And they are also human beings that also got the same right as men have. But who take on in the party? the head of the Women's Welfare Department. The two things is essential on any part. And that we have not acquired it from anywhere. We have born with it. That is one. One is blind faith and surrender. So when the children come to our primary school and we teach them write A like this, and if the child asks, why, madam, like this and why not like this? Can you answer me? You will say, no, whatever I say, you have to learn the A is only written like this. The child has to surrender. He learns A like this and he tells others, ah, my teacher has taught me to write A like this. So A is written only like this. So where what he does? He keeps blind faith in the teacher. And when he learns, he surrenders. You call a cab, you want to go to some destination. You don't ask standing there, Oh driver, do you really know 
fly to drive properly? Can you really take me to my destination? Have you done any accident before? Are you sure you will reach me there? You don't ask. You just have blind faith in the driver. You open the door, you sit in the cab and that is surrender. So blind faith and surrender goes together in anything you want to achieve. Avadhutika Ananda Karuna tells of her first meeting with Baba. And now when I came to join this mission, so first I saw him at Gajipur, evening five o'clock. Then he asked me, how, how are you? And I said, I am all right. Then he said, you know everything. And I'm very surprised because that time I don't know English, Hindi and any language. He said, no, 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 you know everything. But I told him in, in my mind, I do not express in my mind, that I, I thinking in my mind that I don't know anything, I don't know English, I don't know anything, then how he can say I know everything? I'm very surprised. It, I, actually it is happened is 25th December 1966, evening 5 o'clock, and 27th December automatic from my mouth is coming Hindi and English, just fluently. Nobody can understand where from I get it. I do not write, I do not read out, I do not anything, I never learn, but automatic it is come. So this is the greatest uh, experience for my life. And when I saw Baba, then Baba is asked me that I have two hands. Mm -hmm. One hand is male and one is female. If my one hand is very less, not mm -hmm. strong, then how I can flew? The bird cannot flew. In one with one wing. Wings. Then Baba said, okay, then I need to make the strong two wings. Then I could not understand first in the beginning what he said. Then after I said, oh, Baba actually is telling to us. They, because we are few didis, not so many didis. Then he want to increase our didis section. That we, Baba's two hands can be strong and then he can work more strongly. He created the Women's Welfare Department in 1965 and the Women's Welfare Department has many kind of sub-sections or branches. So one is the, the education section uh, which runs schools, uh, children's schools all over the world uh, in uh, disadvantaged or developing countries and also in the developed world. So there's many schools run by uh, sisters and didis all over the world. We have a section called PWSA, which is Progressive Women's Spiritual Association, which is more focused on sort of adult literacy amongst women, or not only literacy but getting out of economic <laughs> disadvantage, let's say. PWSA, then we have uh, the GV, which is called Girls Volunteers, which runs like camps and programs to develop the physical uh, strength of women. So we do things like have martial arts training, self-defense training. We talk about the, the problems women face in society. My sons and my daughters are just like two hands of mine. They are just like two wings of a bird. A bird having one wing cannot fly. You know, there's enough wealth on this planet to satisfy the needs of everyone, but there's not enough wealth in the universe to satisfy the greed of even one. One of the principles of Proud is that there should be no accumulation of wealth without the permission of society. This very principle goes at the heart of the problem the world today is facing, which is the concentration of wealth, which is the destruction of the environment. It is caused by the very fundamental principle of capitalism, which is that there is freedom of accumulation, unlimited freedom to accumulate wealth. There is another uh, principle of Proud that says that uh, there should be maximum utilization of uh, resources and proper distribution of these resources. We have uh, today a situation in which there is actually enough food on the planet for everyone that lives there, all the people, but because of lack of uh, proper distribution of the food, there is not enough for everyone. That is the problem. It is not 
because we have too many people or because we don't have enough resources. We do have enough resources, but these resources are not properly distributed. The context of Prout, the historical context, is a global context more, much more than any Indian context. And the global context is that by 1959, the middle of the 20th century when Prout was given, we had already endured on this planet two world wars. And people were gearing up for the Third World War. There was an expectation of it. The Cold War between Russia and the U.S. was already uh, in play. Communism was viewed as a global menace, and capitalism was starting beginning the post-war economic boom or benefits that, that occurred in capitalist countries had already gone on the wane and now the gap between the rich and the poor was extending once again. So globally, globally people were in despair. They were seeking an answer, seeking a solution. There was that type of condition that humanity around the world was and even today remains in despair and I think one of the symbols of that despair is the fact that there's a doomsday clock that gets updated every year and that people keep an eye on that their sense that we are self-destructing whether it's due to environmental causes or economic causes or social causes there's a sense that we have been for quite some time been heading in the wrong direction. And what is the right direction? You hardly found anyone who had more than an inkling of what we should do, more than an idea about, well, we could do this in this area. Our human society is to move forward. Movement is the order of life. Movement is the order of society. But common people do not know how to move, what to do, what is the destination. They want guidance. My guru is in jail because he opposes this whole system. Because he speaks his mind. Because he's the only one who doesn't kowtow to these politicians and give them blessings and everything. He's the one who stands firm and talks, you know. It's said that even the Prime Minister once wanted to meet him and he sent back a message that, um, you know, women are throwing their children in wells because they can't feed them, while certain persons are putting money in Swiss bank accounts. That Baba never wanted that his spirituality should function in the society as a separate entity. He wanted that the social life, the whole social life should be <coughs> along with its move, it should move along with the spirituality. That's why he gave spiritual philosophy at the same time mm -hmm. social philosophy. I understand. Because he wanted that there should be a society which should which which has the blending of spirituality and materialism mm -hmm. because as i told you earlier that materialism alone is not helpful it is try it is creating so much problem in the world today and whatever we see the problem throughout the world is only because of this fact mm -hmm. that spirituality has been neglected and only material aspect of life is being uh, taken care of and is being considered as the essential part for the society. That's why the two existing philosophies like capitalism and, and communism, they grew without spirituality. But India has so much spirituality and still we see so much poverty. Yeah, it's only because the spirituality was there but material aspect was neglected. Ah, I see. The blending wasn't there. The blending was not there. And it is for the first time that Anand Mukherjee, who is also actual name is Prabhat Ranjan Sarkar, mm -hmm. he preferred that both these uh, spirituality and material philosophy 
<coughs> should be blended. And for that purpose, he gave that Proud philosophy. Progressive utilization Progress, theory. Yeah. And he actually wants that the future society of this world should be based on this spiritual material aspect of life, which Baba has given in Proud philosophy. Okay. Just in brief, how will Proud elevate this type of economic condition, people living in mud huts, and bring them into the modern world. How will Proud do that? The Proud philosophy advocates that the economic aspect of life, the <clears throat> of, of the society, should not be in the hands of only few persons. Mm -hmm. So, Baba is, is in his own economic philosophy, <laughs> he has said, that there should be three aspects of economy. Mm -hmm. One, to be governed or controlled by the uh, state government. Mm -hmm. The other, the middle uh, aspect of economy should be controlled by the society, mm -hmm. by the social people in the form of cooperative. Even the very big in industries will be formed on the basis of cooperative. Mm -hmm. And that means the cooperation of all the people of the society will be there. Mm -hmm. They will be the master of the, of the industries or the companies. They will be the master. And not private ownership. And not only uh, the few individuals will be the owner. Oh, I understand. <clears throat> so, with the help of cooperative industry and the state managed industry and the small uh, industry will be given to the individuals. That is what Baba has done in his proud philosophy. So naturally when the, all the human beings, all the even village people or the, uh, the city people will be involved in the economic development, naturally there will not be disparity. Right. Much disparity, I should say. Right. Later Dis Baba, Baba called that economic democracy, no? Yes, yes. Our philosophy is, is known as economic democracy. Mm -hmm. Not political democracy, yeah. but economic yeah. democracy. And it is always progressive. See, in the beginning, the minimum necessity of life will be guaranteed. To everyone. In the beginning, minimum necessity of the life will be guaranteed to everyone. Mm -hmm. and later on, as the economy will grow, so naturally the benefit will go to everyone. So everyone will slowly grow and grow and become more uh, economically developed, and intellectually developed, and spiritually developed. At the moment, we're still bogged down in materialism or even our psychic activities are geared towards material comfort or achievement so he wanted to change the collective psychology that no yes we need the physical world and we need comfort and you know uh, whatever progress in the spiritual world but at the same time there's so much more to achieve and so much more to experience and enjoy in the psychic and in the spiritual world. So he wanted all human beings, males and females, to move cooperatively and collectively towards that kind of society where we wouldn't discriminate against each other due to gender or race or economic status in society. We are in the process of creating a new social order. Mm -hmm. Now his mission was that materialism alone is a myth. Materialism without spirituality is a myth. And spirituality without materialism is a myth. So his philosophy is a blend of materialism and spirituality. So on that basis he not only brought up the organization, but his family was also like that. So the scriptures saying that if you do not do it, you will go to hell. Like this, these scriptures, they are the worst enemy of human society because these scriptures create a complex, a fear complex in human mind and that fear complex creates 
disparity in this human society. This human society is one, is a singular entity. It cannot be divided. It must not be divided. And we won't allow any such entities to create any physical tendency in this human society. Whatever a man is to do in his spiritual life, he is to do it. Why? Because he is in love with the Supreme Entity. Love is the first word, love is the starting point, and love is the last point. Scriptures have got no moral right to create fear complex in human mind. One time Baba asked me, this, that day Baba was talking to me like we were friends. All my life, every meeting with Baba, he was like my father. And dear, but always with this distance and sense of respect. And Baba adopted the role that was in my mind, but that day Baba wanted to play friends. <laughs> I don't know. He was talking to me just like we were friends, and then he hit me with, I'll be Devananda. They say I am a dangerous man. What do you say, I'll be Devananda? Am I a dangerous man? Like he really cared what I think, you know? And I didn't know what to say. Flipped the coin, came down heads. I said, yes, Baba, you are a dangerous man. Baba said, no, I am not a dangerous man. I have love for each and every being of this universe. I have universal love. I am not a dangerous man. I am a strong man. Then he closed his eyes and he went into this tantric mood. And then his voice starts to take on, you know, like vibrating the whole universe. And he said, only those who like the fishies. Thinking, you know, Baba's, we're friends, so I can interrupt even his tantric mood. I said, Baba, what? Baba, step back, Baba. you're interrupting me, but he didn't say anything. I said, Baba, what is this fishy? He said, fishy. I said, Baba, what is this fishy? He said, fishy. F I S H Y. I said, oh, fishy. Okay, continue, Baba. Close eyes. Only those who like the fishy smell of selfishness are afraid of me, because selfishness is a mental disease that Prout does not give scope to. You are not to engage your mind in any psychophysical or physical for any psychophysical or physical pebulum. Utilize that time, utilize each and every respiration of your existence in doing the kirtana of the Supreme. Now you may do kirtan. Kirtan is something that Baba introduced in the year 1970 or 71, very uh, close to the time, before the time when he went to jail. It was along with his 16 points when he was uh, compiling the comprehensive spiritual discipline of his Ananda Marga, his spiritual path. And that was completed just before he went to jail so that we all knew what we had to do. And in that system, the last of the 16 points is CSDK. C meant conduct rules and detail, S seminar D duty, the service project, your obligation to do some sort of some sort of social service, and the K was Kirtana. We did not have that before. We simply did not have it before. And in those early days, there were even many people who said, Oh, 
I don't want to dance like this, you know. Uh, I feel silly. We had a lot of intellectuals in, in uh, Ananda Marga, and they felt a bit awkward. They saw this as something that maybe Hare Krishnas might do, but why should we do it? Uh, but it just took off. It became a, an amazing thing. And nowadays, all around the world, we can hear people who aren't initiated into Ananda Marga, who aren't members of Ananda Marga, singing and dancing Baba Nam Kevalam. It's a great and powerful mantra. You know, Baba used to say that unless there is morality in life, there cannot be spirituality. So, uh, he gave him classes on morality very much. And he not only told them, but he checked them many times. And if somebody is violating moral codes, then he would charge them, he would, he would child them, he would sometimes punish them to some extent. We let these people should persecute. You should follow our strict adherence of your code of discipline meditation, fasting, conduct rules, yogasana, pranayam, all these things will have to be strict. Let, when people will know that what we are, they will understand later on. He not only brought up the organization, but his family was also like that. That is the beauty of it. His father worked in the, library, in the railway department also as an accountant. And after his death, he got, Baba also got the same post. But his father was also a very good homeopath. And he was so much charitable person that every evening after the office hour was over, he would sit in his dispensary and uh, give medicine free of cost to all those who were needing person. His character was also very of high dignity. Baba Mazabad, she was also very noble lady, very noble, very much disciplined. And... Uh, See, when the first, uh, Baba's father died in the year 1944, perhaps, if I'm correct, <clears throat> it was a very bad situation for the family economically. But his mother was uh, uh, keen that all his children should uh, grow even without the father. And somehow she managed with very meager amount of uh, fund that the father left. And uh, by then, Anand Murtiji, our Baba, became a uh, high school. Uh, he passed his high school uh, from Jamalpur school. And uh, he wanted to join the job. But the mother said, no, 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 you should go for higher study. So the, insistive, uh, Baba, the mother insisted that he should go for, to Calcutta for higher studies. Baba had to leave because of the pressure of the mother. So he went to Calcutta and he studied. Uh, the intermediate science from Calcutta. And after that, in two years, after two years, when he passed it, he came back to Jamalpur and he joined the, joined the same job which his father was doing in the railway department. And when did Baba's mother pass away? Uh, in 1976. While wow, Baba was in jail. When Baba was in jail. What about Baba's older sister? We're told that, that Baba had great respect for his sister. His uh, elder sister was nine years older to him. And uh, in childhood, she took care of him personally. And uh, the uh, beginning of uh, his, his education, uh, she has a very good uh, uh, help that she gave to him for his childhood education. And naturally, he was very much obedient to his uh, elder sister and to his mother. <clears throat> so, uh, whenever she would ask anything him, from him, he will certainly oblige. <clears throat> and then his brothers were all younger to him. All the brothers were younger to him. What about them? What were they like? They were also very nice in nature. But only he had three more brothers. And... Uh, all they were very respectful to Baba because he was the eldest person. <clears throat> and uh, uh, they also grew in the atmosphere of his spirituality. Mm -hmm. Except one, he didn't join Anand Mark, but then he was ethical. Uh -huh. He didn't join Anand, he didn't uh, 
treat Baba as Guru. But two of his brothers treated Baba both as elder brother and as a Guru. When he blessed me, he put his hand on my head. And I felt a lot of energy going into my cells. But the rest of the interview, he played games with me. And I was totally clashed. But even so, all the way home on the rickshaw, I still felt his hand on me. And when I went to do meditation, because we had been trained to be very disciplined in Australia, when I went to do meditation, when we got back, I had a meditation like I had never had before. And I understood that today I had really seen God. When I was at school, I used to talk with my friend, how, how is it possible to change the world? There are so many problems. And at that time, I felt uh, it's important to change oneself. This is the most important thing. And that's what attracted me to the spiritual, the spiritual path. That I had to go within myself and make, make myself a better person. And so when you go inside, you should know this by experience, by meditation, you'll know it. Then you come to the Mahat, the principle, I ah, oh, well, oh, then you hope. I am being witnessed. I am being taken care of. See if you start friendship, thinking mean talking to your do right. Actually Anandamar has two visions, yes. two aspects of work. One is the spiritual, Atmokchartham and Jagat Hitaecha. In Atmokchartham, we are teaching you lessons how to concentrate your mind, how to develop your mind, in show. And outside is our social service work. So, Dada, yes, we all know that Baba was arrested in 71. He spent uh, nearly seven years in jail. Yes. Fasted for five years, four months, two days while in jail. We know that story, but mm -hmm. why was Baba arrested in the first place? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a very good uh, story about it. And uh, there is too much of politics also in it, uh -huh. Indian politics. Right. Rather, I should say international politics was playing some game. So you want to say then that Indira Gandhi herself fundamentally was not opposed to Ananda Marga, but due to political exigencies, due to political opportunism, she switched her position. Yes, to see the relief really and she was appreciating Ananda Marga. Soon after that what happened, that she was fearing some of her political opponent in the Congress party itself. Mm -hmm. There had been some senior leaders, <coughs> like Murarji Desai. Right. He was deputy prime minister at that time. Some monks were uh, framed with the charge of conspiracy and murder. And uh, in 1971, in the month of end of this December, Anand Murthy was arrested from his residence of Patliputra, Patna, Bihar. Mm -hmm. He was arrested and he was taken to prison. While Baba was, uh, Anand Murthy was in prison, <coughs> they they were attempted to kill Anand Murthy by any means, even in jail. Mm -hmm. I can tell you a very good story mm -hmm. that in 1972 or 73, one uh, murderer, a murderer was deputed to kill Anand Murthy inside the cell in which he was living. Mm -hmm. He attempted two times to kill him. One time when he went to see or enter into the cell of Ananda Murtiji, he saw that he is not there. He was not there. Mm -hmm. In the midnight at 12 o'clock, when he was close inside the cell, mm -hmm. <coughs> he was, the murderer was allowed to enter somehow. When he entered there, he saw that Ananda Murtiji is not there. So he came out and told the police force that whom to kill, there is none. So that day was over. 
again CBI asked her to do something again, once again. Mm -hmm. Next time, after a few days, again that murderer went into the inside the cell. Mm -hmm. Then he found that the cell is so hot that he would die if he enters there. So he came out and he then promised that he will not kill him, he cannot kill him at all. Mm -hmm. So two attempts failed. Then, <coughs> then he, the, uh, the government of uh, Indira Gandhi and CBI and the CPM, with the help of CBI, attempted to kill him through poisoning. Mm. So, the doctor was deputed for that one. Mm -hmm. The jail doctor was deputed. And on one occasion when Anand Murthy ji complained of, complained of some problem, physical problem, the doctor, at the midnight he came, he gave some medicine, Anand Murthy ji took it, and that medicine was so powerful that it worked as poison to him. And actually, I can say that it was a case of poisoning. Mm -hmm. Then Anand Murthy ji uh, <coughs> uh, wrote a letter to the governor and the, uh, you know, the central, uh, the, the prime minister of India and the president of India that there should be judicial inquiry about uh, uh, on, on this issue of, of uh, poisoning him inside the jail. But the government didn't hear. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, there was a private judicial inquiry. Mm -hmm. It is known as Chakravarti Commission. Right. That Chakravarti Commission, it was amply proved that in the form of medicine, he was poisoned. That was over. But Baba could not be killed. So, he propounded one theory known as drought, progressive utilization theory. And that was the cause for persecution. Which I came out from the jail, I inquired from the doctors, some Margi doctors and other doctors were there. They immediately told that he had, he was, he had been poisoned. And these are the reactions of the poison. Then what happened in spite that we just tried to just, there should inquiry into this incident. Who is the persons behind this nefarious work? So we wanted judicial inquiry, judicial proof. The Indira government, because she was not in position to, she was, she never gave opportunity to express ourselves, to place the fact before the public <coughs> that what is the thing. She suppressed this thing, she didn't in, uh, institute inquiry. Baba was compelled to go on fast from 1st April 1973 and he continued his fast up to 78. So, five years, four months and one day he continues his fast. I wrote a letter to the President of India that I know who are the black hands working from behind the curtain. <laughs> he wants peaceful society and how it can be that's why he has given the practical, uh, you know, the theories. And we'll have to implement it. The proud, if it is done, implemented, then there is no misery, there is no poverty. Everybody is equal, everybody is in peace and love. You know, when he was in prison, and uh, if that CBI arrested him, and he was poisoned, so what he did was, the, the CBI asked, Mr. Priya Sarkar, you, de you denounce Prout, then we will release you on condition and, and we will start propagating that you are God on this earth. Baba told that, no, whether you now is it I am God or not, but my, my love for the suffering humanity, which I have propound, propounded this proud philosophy, will stand. You can do whatever you like. But I stand for this. That fast continued, we thought, how long can anyone continue in a jail cell fasting? After he came out of jail, then we learned that it wasn't just fasting. We could understand, hey, living in a prison cell, he spread his mission around the world with greater speed than it could have been done, directing, saying, do this, do that, because there was a strong sentiment. And while walking in Bangkok, he told me, you know, while I was in prison, I was doing a special tantric ceremony. Only then did he reveal the fact that that this, this 
system, this process, is a way of rejuvenating the body. And he said, while undergoing this fast, I rejuvenated, I refreshed all the organs of my body. Everything improved. I even started to grow a third set of teeth. Everything improved except just my eyesight. That also would have improved if I'd continued for a few weeks more, but I had to come out of jail when I did for the welfare of my mission. He'd achieved his purpose in jail, he came out, and the next phase began. He said, I wanted to teach this practice to some of my children because at present I'm the only person on the planet who knows this technique. But you see, it takes a lot of time. He was fasting five years, four months, two days. It takes a lot of time, and my boys, my girls, they're all so busy. When will they get the time to practice this? So it was amusing, and at the same time, eye-opening. It was all a plan, but he also a mysterious plan, because we didn't realize any of that was going on at the time. Uh, this poisoning case, I took up the case in the United Nations. I met youth aunt was at that time, secretary general at that time. Myself, one American sister and one American Margi. We met him and he wrote a letter to Indira Gandhi that PR Sarkar is not a ordinary human prisoner. prisoners. He should be treated as a, some special person in the prison. On February 12th of 1973, Baba was poisoned inside the prison itself. The hand that poisoned Baba was that of the prison doctor. He did that foul deed under order coming directly from the Prime Minister's office. A normal person would have died. Baba went into a coma. When he emerged from the coma, he was blind for about a week. It took almost a month for him to return to normal health. At that time, he and our organization demanded a high-level investigation into the event. In support of that demand, Baba began a protest fast. However, as the true culprit for, the, for this crime was none other than the government of India, Baba's demand was never met. And so Baba continued his fast from April 1st of 1973 until August 2nd of 1978, when he returned home from prison, having been acquitted of all charges against him. While he was fasting, Baba consumed nothing prepared in the prison, subsisting on a cup of curd water, a little bit of yogurt mixed into a cup of water, once or twice a day. That was brought to him from outside the prison by his personal assistant, Acharya Ramananda Avadhuta. The question in everybody's mind was, how long can Baba survive like that? Majority, those who were in contact with Baba, they were very, you know, Baba will come out today or tomorrow. And he, he has been innocently imprisoned. So there was, was a very long, very big movement around the world. Around the world, protest fasts and appeals to prominent individuals to lend their names on behalf of Baba continued. For example, in 1976 or 77, I met with Mother Teresa in Calcutta. She refused to offer any support, even so much as a letter of inquiry about the case, to the Indian government. Others were more sympathetic, but the results were negligible. Around 1975, in Australia, a more forceful tack was taken and, to some extent, followed up around the world. We called it the War of Dharma. This involved not just protest but street theater and often some persons were arrested for misdemeanors like breaking the peace. Occasionally, traffic might get disrupted or pamphlets thrown down from the gallery onto members of parliament. At the same time as the War of Dharma, we started to see acts of violence from mysterious sources, often accompanied by letters claiming responsibility 
from an unknown group with a name that mimicked an organization Baba had founded. That group, if it even existed at all, called itself the Universal Proudest Revolutionaries Federation. So in Australia and around the world, the War of Dharma had begun. It was just after the emergency, I was kind of lucky because the Mardis were like uh, all under arrest during the emergency and they were just putting their lives back in order and the, the ones abroad, they were like just getting over the shock that the thing, and I was Johnny on the spot, so <laughs> I was able to get out to the jail and they used to in those days have 20 minute interviews with the prisoners, so um, I began this thing of meeting him and getting my 20 minutes and gradually the numbers increased so that so many Margis were coming and they used to go in groups and just do Sastang Pranam and, and I told them, no way Jose, you know, I'm not going to go <laughs> two seconds and meet Baba and go out. I have, a, I have a right, I've been meeting 20 minutes, I get my 20 minutes. <laughs> so I used to go alone and <laughs> sit with Baba for 20 minutes and uh, he was so awesome. Um, I when I was I was always a skeptic about everything. I never believe anything without some kind of proof. Uh, and uh, I had gone to the, I had, I had a doubt about why, like anybody can live for five years on only curd water. It's like really hard for me to swallow. <laughs> Even though he's my guru, I can't help it. So um, I thought I really need to find out, but, but I didn't trust the superintendent will tell me the truth. So I thought I gotta trick this guy. So um, I went to him and I said, like, there's got to be somebody, like, sneaking food into him or something like that. And he told me, no, you've seen the security. Literally, there were six gates you had to go to get to him. Uh, they were locked. They had guards. There was police in the three rooms which Bao was in. The two rooms had police in them all the time. So I asked him, like, okay, then how is it possible that He's living on only curd water, you know, just uh, yogurt water. And he was like, I don't know. What I think I need to convey is what they did to him in that jail. It, it was actually, I don't know, somebody said it was a condemned cell for the person on death row. I'm not really sure, but um, I remember you would go through two gates. There were actually six gates to, <laughs> to get to his room. But... Um, the two main gates outside, and then I remember there was like a little courtyard that you would go through, and it was barren. It, it was probably his exercise area. It was barren. It was just dirt, you know. And then you would you would go to the end, and there was a door, and then you would come back again, and then you would go into his room. His room had only a curtain. There was no door, and that means no privacy, you know. And I don't remember what was behind. <laughs> Bawe was sitting on a choki, on a, on a cot, a wooden cot. And there was either, a, it was a uh, suitcase or it was a trunk in the corner there, because I remember. Um, and the room was like, just a little larger than a bathroom. It was very small and dingy. It was, um, sometimes in India they have bricks missing from the top where the air can come through and light can come. Didn't even have that. It was pitch dark. There was not an ounce of light. The walls were crumbly. It was, it was dreadful. The bed was wobbly, you know. Uh, once it actually, I heard it crashed. I don't know, but I didn't see it. But um, it was a subhuman condition to keep anybody in. No fan. It was an oven, an oven in the summers. The temperatures here go like way over 40 degrees, 40, 42 degrees. It can go up. I don't know in those days in, in Patna what was the temperatures, but it would, it would go up in Delhi to 45, which is around 117 degrees. And I remember sweating to death and sitting in ba with Bawa, sweating to death. And in winter, I was with this, and I was shivering. I was freezing cold because it's very close to Himalayas region. 
One thing I noticed which I found very astonishing to me is these sannyasis, like, today they're very happy and they're very, you know, and tomorrow they're miserable and depressed. <laughs> but Baba never changed. Baba was always smiling. Like, the world was his big joke, you know? And, uh, and he was really, really humorous. He, he was a never-ending source of humor. You must maintain a mental equilibrium, rather equipoise. That is, you must not suffer from any sort of inferiority complex or superiority complex or deputist complex or a complex of hopelessness, despair. That is, your mind should be, should always be in a balanced condition. You must not suffer from inferiority complex nor from superiority complex. A large part of the momentum that Ananda Marga got for growing during those prison years came from the fact that we couldn't imagine how long Baba would survive. We thought that Baba could die any time from his protest fast. And the conditions, the legal conditions, were equally dire. Several times there were attempts made on Baba's life. I, we used to have meetings twice a year, global meetings in Nepal, and as I was representing one of the nine sectors, Australasia, I would go to those meetings uh, in... they mostly took place in Nepal because India became a state of... Uh, it came under a state of martial law in 1975 when Indira Gandhi shut down all opposition altogether and banned our organization. Indira Gandhi banned, if I recall correctly, 36 organizations of which 24 were associated with Ananda Marga. Anything that was affiliated, associated with Ananda Marga, Baba's organization, was Banned. And what it meant to be a banned organization was that if you openly stated, accepted, admitted, uh, confirmed your association with that organization, you would be arrested and thrown in jail. And so during those emergency days, there were literally uh, hundreds, possibly thousands of Ananda Margis who were thrown in jail for no other reason other than the fact that they were associated with the organization. There was no, there was no uh, criminal offense, there was just the association. And it was in that state of emergency that the case against Baba, the legal case, came to court, and naturally, not a single witness could be called for Baba's defense because they were all in jail or they would be arrested the moment they walked into court to testify and it was under those circumstances that the conviction was attained, the conviction against Baba. When the state of emergency was lifted and a new prime minister came into power, then the appeal on Baba's conviction was heard and Baba was acquitted. It's hard to say which came first, and perhaps there was no causal relationship at all. But as the war of Dharma heated up, so too the repression of our organization in India became more and more severe. During that emergency, I was also arrested, mm -hmm. because I was an activist of Anand mm -hmm. So all Anand Marg was banned because Anand Marg was a very powerful organization. She wanted to curse. That was an opportunity for Indira Gandhi to curse Anand Marg. So Anand Marg was also banned. Mm -hmm. I was also sent to the jails. Like many other, like me, went to the jail. I was in jail for about 19 months during the emergency period. During that period, when no Anand Marg can face, can come out uh, without fear, and during that period, Baba's case, that murder case, was opened. And there was none to uh, help him in that case. Mm -hmm. No Margi would come out. Testify there was financial him. problem. Mm -hmm. But our advocates were so sincere. One Nagishar Prashad was the advocate right. and some other advocates were there. They said, go ahead. 
<laughs> we shall not charge anything, but we shall fight out this case. Hmm. They were so moral and ethical. And ultimately, the case was fought in the legal, I mean, it was a legal battle. And what happened, that in the lower court, in the district court, Baba was convicted during emergency. Mm -hmm. And the conviction was for the life. Both Baba, Anand Murti ji, and five other persons. During that period, when the emergency period was over, naturally all Anand Margis were made to free from the jail. Mm -hmm. I was also, I was also, I got freedom from the jail. <clears throat> and after the emergency was over, Anand Murti ji's murder charge, murder case was brought to High Court in appeal. And in that appeal, it was proved that all cases are all uh, not with the, uh, no evidence is there, proper evidence is there, in which Anand Murti ji has been convicted. Right. So the conviction was set aside by the High Court of Patna. And Anand Murti ji became free. Throughout the time that Baba was in jail, he somehow managed to run the organization even from within his jail cell. Of course, it wasn't the same day-to-day -day direct handling of events, but <clears throat> important questions, important decisions were generally run past him. We would somehow manage to smuggle in a question or two and manage to smuggle out Baba's answers uh, in writing. And when he came out of jail, we can say he <coughs> hit the ground running. He was released on 2nd August. The whole world was watching when Baba is coming, when Baba is coming. Great enthusiasm. All over the Margis, they wanted to know when Baba is coming. So Margis were peering from different places. Because it, it was in the news that Baba is being released, honorably acquitted, so their emergency lifted and all the workers and other Margis were also fully, fully released. You know, when Baba came out of jail, the whole of Patna, Baba was in prison in Patna, and the day he was released, the whole city went on holiday. All the shops closed, the streets were thronged, there was a big parade taking Baba from the prison back to his home, but it was so crowded that what should have been a five-minute car drive took hours, literally hours. The car could only inch along and people were all in tears. Everybody was crying, but Baba was unmoved. He was exactly the same. People said, this is a great day for you. And Baba said, the victory of Dharma, the victory of righteousness, is an ordinary event. It's not a major cause for celebration. And so even to this day, the day that, uh, even till now, the day when Baba came out of jail, it's not any kind of celebration inside of Anandamar. Most people can't even remember what that day was. So Baba remained the same. This was one of the most remarkable things about him. Again, who can be unmoved by coming out of jail after seven years and a, and a fast that went for five and a half years? Who can be unmoved by it? But he was the same. After my return from India, a few months later, I was traveling around the United States hitchhiking telling everyone about the 16 points, the spiritual discipline that Baba had compiled and that no one really knew yet, and about Prout. And on that journey, twice around the USA, hitchhiking, almost every day to a new place, I had many experiences, but one dream made a huge impact on my life over the next seven years. In that dream, Baba said to me, April will be a very good month, and in May, I will come out. My interpretation of the dream was that something good is going to happen in the month of April, and in May, Baba's going to come out of jail. 
However, as we know, so every year would roll around and every April I would get excited and every May I would be wondering, is it possible that Baba is going to come out? Finally, in the year 1978, I had received an assurance back, well, in 1977, late 1977, I received an assurance directly from Baba that our next meeting would not be in the jail once more, but that I could choose the place, I could choose the time. So in 1978, in the month of May, early in May, I flew to India with a determination to meet Baba in his house, not in the jail, but in his house only. I expected Baba was coming out in the month of May, but it didn't happen. Being a rather stubborn person, I waited till June and through July, and finally on August 2nd, Baba came out of jail. I was confused. Baba had told me he's going to come out in the month of May. He came out in the month of August. The next year, 1979, we had a very good April. Baba was refusing to travel unless at the airport itself. The Margis, the Margi brothers were out in force dancing Tandava, this old Shaivite dance created by Shiva with skull and daggers symbolizing the fight between good and evil, life and death. And in the month of April, finally in the month of April, the Supreme Court of India recognized Anandamarga as a bona fide spiritual path and that Tandava was one of our compulsory rites. Henceforth, it was possible for the Margis to dance Tandava at the airport as Baba was arriving and leaving. Till then, the government of West Bengal had banned the practice. The government of India was also opposed. And so having, having gotten that clearance, having won what we call the Tandava case, Baba was free to travel, and in May of 1979, Baba embarked on his first world tour. That year, he completed two world tours. Even before Baba came out of jail, August 2nd, 1982, even before he came out of jail, Baba started to expand the organization. He added some, I forget the number, 20 or 30 different new departments, wings. He expanded everything tremendously. We got people's day schools and people's night schools. We had got so many new departments and wings before Baba came out of jail. And as soon as Baba came out of jail, that expansion went on increasing. Of course, the one thing that's clear in any objective analysis of Baba's life is that he really knew what was coming. He gave his 16 points, his comprehensive spiritual path just before he went into jail so that everyone knew what they were going to do. He knew he was coming out of jail so he wanted to come, come out with a running start. So he gave a whole bunch of new organizations Every step of the way was planned. At the very end of his life, he waited till the last eight years of his life to begin to give his music 5,000 songs. Nobody would do such a thing if they didn't know that I have this fixed amount of time to give what I have to give. And, uh... This was very, very big event, very big crowd in everywhere because 
Baba came out of the prison, many Margis have not seen Baba, so they gathered in one place. So many scriptures say so many things and they are sometimes contradictory to one another. Now what to do? What an ordinary man is to do? Whom to follow and whom not to follow? Smritayo Bivinna. There are so many social codes in the world. whom to follow and whom not to follow. And amongst the intellectuals, there are so many, there are diversities of opinions. One intellectual doesn't support the views of others. And it is the greatest weakness of intellectuals that they always encourage disunity. They always support heterogeneity. And one spiritual aspirant once upon a time remarked that these intellectuals are the polished satans. Then where lies the secret of dharma? 
dharma means spirituality not spiritualism but spirituality dharma shatatvam nihitam guhayam now the supreme entity the controlling entity the final stance of dharma lies coverted within one's own eye feeling that is you have to search internally and not externally everything is within you because the parama purusha always remains with you within the very core of your heart so search within oh the spiritual aspirant not without but within within your very existence mahajano jena gata sapantha so you are to follow the path you are to follow the cult and you are do accord you are to do according to the approaches done by the aspirants in the past the kaulas of the past you are to be practical in your life of occult science your only object of ideation is parama purusha and not any dogma nor any scripture on the first tour he visited switzerland germany sweden netherlands france and spain the second tour began in thailand then moved on to Taiwan, Greece, Israel, Turkey, Iceland, Germany, Jamaica, and finally Venezuela. Baba was declined a visa to the USA, and Baba himself declined to set foot in England. On the second of the two world tours, Baba was also denied entry to the Philippines, despite having received a valid visa. However, in 1969, Baba had already visited the Philippines twice. I came for Dharma Samiksha. Uh-huh. So during that time you did it. Okay. You died. So Dharma Samiksha was in 1981. In mid-1981, Baba took up a new program, something that had never been done by any guru in the history of the world. In short, Baba called all of his disciples from around the world to visit him in Calcutta for undergoing what he called Dharma Samhika, inspection of dharma. Through this program, Baba burned the very seeds of our sanskara, unrequited reactions to binding past actions. The process of Dharma Samhika went in three parts. First, reporting of service work done along with punishment for inadequate performance second prescription of asanas yogic exercises to balance the glandular system and third baba's blessing for further advancement in spiritual life the way it was the part we do why it was the part we follow is that as we were in the one fighting okay Yeah. 
Certainly the most amusing and terrifying part of Dharma Samhika was the first part. It began in a rather low-key manner. Baba would ask a disciple for her or his name, as if he did not know already, and then he would ask, what is your duty? By that he meant, what work are you doing for the mission? And so, for example, an appropriate response would be, Baba, I am a diocese-level education secretary in Mongolia. And up to that point, everyone knew how to respond. Then Baba would ask, what was your output? What have you accomplished? And at that stage, things became a bit tricky. If you told the truth, you knew it would not be good enough. But if you told a lie, you knew you would get caught. So regardless of what you said, Baba would generally respond with unsatisfactory. What happened next was almost comical. Baba began a mini-drama. What's that? A flying buffalo just came and whispered in my ear? And what that buffalo, or some other winged animal whispered, was some truly amazing story. It always seemed that the person whose character was being inspected had done some horrific thing, something that no one knew about often, but not always, of a sexual nature. When it was sexual and the culprit was a man, Baba would generally call for someone to bring the Japanese scissors. Well, much to everyone's relief, those scissors never turned up. But the small stick like a bamboo pointer that got applied to our backside by Baba's general secretary or personal assistant could smart a bit. And now, regardless of that secret crime, it became public knowledge. Everyone somehow managed to survive that first part of Dharma Samhika. The first part could seem to last forever, but the second and third parts were quite brief. For the second part, Baba simply looked up and down one's body like an x-ray scanner, going from head to toe and back to head again. And after that, Baba prescribed a set of asanas for the disciple, yogic exercises that she or he was to practice morning and night. In our Acharya training, we learned a lot about the effects of different asanas. In Baba's book, Yogic Treatments and Natural Remedies, that knowledge was amplified. In Dharma Samhika, with its thousands of test cases, much more was imparted. But sad to say, the notebooks where that information was copied down are now missing, hopefully not lost forever. I'm a medical doctorate from Temple University in Philadelphia. And in what form of medicine do you practice? Family practice. The practice of yoga has been central to my life since about the age of 20 or 21. Ananda Murtaji, the guru of Ananda Marga, gave a system of yoga exercises, roughly 43 of them, and other mudras that affect the glandular system, and they also coordinate the breathing, and they also coordinate the mind. So many of the other yoga systems that are around spend more time on the angulation and the spinal erectness and the limbs, whereas Ananda Murtaji's system incorporates that by reference and also focuses more heavily on concentrating on which chakra a particular yoga asana presses on. So you get glandular effects, you get digestive effects, and so those are a bit unique in the yoga world. Mm -hmm. So oh, why only 43? There are like must be thousands of yoga exercises. So Baba mentioned that there are these thousands, and he gave these 43 especially for people who want to do yoga as a spiritual practice. 
So he hasn't focused so directly on yoga for physical cure, but rather as balancing the hormones so that you could do better meditation. So Baba wrote a book called Yogic Treatments and Natural Remedies. In Sanskrit it's called Yogika Chikitsa Odravya Guna. And in that book he reportedly it was the hardest book he ever wrote because he had to do a lot of investigation psychically and however else I don't know to ask to, to get the aspect of what herbs, not only which asanas, but which diet, and also the pathophysiology of 20, 40, 50 diseases, so that he can explain it to people. And he also incorporated Ayurvedic concepts. I use personally uh, some of the asanas for my own digestive purposes and to keep my blood pressure under control. And so I have found that the asanas are useful for other people, partly for back pain and also partly for uh, digestive problems especially. It's been used for constipation and also a little bit for asthma. Mm -hmm. So I've used these in my practice and with other people as well. The idea of Microvita was given in 1986 mm -hmm. and in the following four years uh, Piyasaka gave uh, a good number of di discourses and I studied it and I was fascinated. I was really fascinated because I thought that this is what I was looking for for uh, the previous the, the, the decades before. I mean, I was a Maiki already for two decades, and I was looking for something like that. Okay, coming back to your field, one last question. You are a qualified, uh, certified doctor. What can we expect in the field of medicine from a better understanding and uh, the utilization of microvitamin? I mean, I'm not a pharmacologist. I, I'm not able to produce new medicines. This is the field of pharmacology, so mm -hmm. pharmacology research. Mm -hmm. But I'm very close to that field because I have to... I, I'm getting the medicines from their laboratories and use them, mm -hmm. even if they are quite new. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know what a very difficult and costly and lengthy process is, it is to produce new medicines. Mm -hmm. So to produce new medicines that is beyond our uh, reach. We cannot do that, but we can work conceptualizing ways of producing new medicines. Mm -hmm. And uh, You mean at this time it's beyond at this our time. reach? I'm Let's but talk in the future, futuristic. Yes, in the future they will be able to apply these concepts and produce new medicines. And that comes out of a rebirth of alchemy. Mm -hmm. The alchemy was used in ancient times when it was a good science and when it was not degenerated like in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. In the good times of alchemy it was used in three ways. Mm -hmm. It was used for producing uh, materials, mm -hmm. especially in the uh, uh, production of uh, metals. Mm -hmm. Then it was used uh, for producing uh, medicines, mm -hmm. making, transforming poisonous mm -hmm. into healing substances, mm -hmm. and it was used, that is always rem uh, forgotten, but it is to be remembered, it was used for transforming ordinary pe people into qualified, into noble people, mm -hmm. into noble people which are able to bear tasks which are not uh, done by ordinary people. Okay. For example, to make out of a, a, a child a king. The last part of Dharma Samhika was Baba's blessing. Baba called the disciple to him and gave his blessing, sitting his boys on his lap or touching lightly the head of the girls. After that, despite any and all punishment received, everyone went away feeling mentally much lighter. I heard of one young boy who was asked by an immigration official on leaving India what he had done in the country. Proudly he lifted his shirt to show a few stripes on his side as he declared, I attended Dharma Samhika with my guru. The mission of Ananda Marga, or the mission of Baba more accurately speaking, is to create a new world, a new society, a new and ever newer and newer society, always moving in a progressive fashion towards greater oneness with the Supreme, towards greater perfection. 
we saw in Baba not just words of love for every living being of the of the universe, certainly of the world, but we saw actions that reflected it, like his wildlife preserve and his uh, rational program, rational plant program. In February of 1982, Baba began a series of discourses which took this new social outlook, this broadened humanism that Baba called neo-humanism, that took his outlook and his concept of a human, an ideal human being, and gave it form. So in early 1982, Baba gave us the philosophy, the social outlook of neo-humanism. And for the first time, someone had the vision and courage to say unequivocally that all living beings, not just human beings, have equal existential value. For the first time, someone had stated clearly and simply that we must make a choice between two principles that may guide our lives, guide our thoughts, our words, our actions. Either we can follow the principle of selfish pleasure, or we can follow the principle of social equality. Neo-humanism stands firmly on the principle of social equality. By giving the philosophy of neo-humanism, and which we are introducing in all our schools, Mm -hmm. We are laying the foundations of a universal mind. And I think that's what is going to transform this world, the philosophy of neo-humanism. In India, the people are very much involved in the caste system. So he wants to break this particular, you know, the caste the root of this, cause of, you know, the uh, degradation in the human society. The dogmas, you know, the, those who are being identify that they are the sacred hair, sacred thread. So he wanted to cut it off. So that this was a revolution in the country. And that's why he had to face challenges in the beginning. And later on the people started knowing it. Oh, these are real organizations which they preach humanity is one and invisible. So there should not be any those who are trying to divide it. They are the enemy, enemies of the societies. Yes. And that's why he encourages Revolutionary marriage. One caste married mm -hmm. to another a caste, upper caste, lower caste. One, one religion ca married to another, another religion. religion. Uh, that was the theory. It is our theory. We fight for this. One race married to another race. And yes. they get blending instead of being Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That was the intention. Hearing them off always. Where is the Japati? The new humanism is propounded by Lord Sri Sri Ananda Murti GP as Sarkar. We call him Baba. His only intention to propound new humanism is to take care of all living beings, animate inanimate living beings of this planet, beautiful earth. So, first human beings, when they are affected in any realm, physical, psychic or spiritual, he has propounded this yoga philosophy, your spiritual science to get peace of mind. But care has been taken for the plants and animals too. So that's why that's, he says that, you know, there is one department known as prevention of cruelty to animals and plants. Baba said, uh, as a new humanist, that up till now the human sentiment was very alive, but Baba had the great love for plants and animals. Many times in our report he used to say, what new humanists are doing for the street dogs what new humanists are doing for the stones which are broken and hills in the area of Hananda. So 
follow for plants, for animals, for stones. He was loving for the humanity. He wanted the ecological balance in the whole world. So in 1978, 79, 80, he was leading up to something as well. One of the programs Baba started was a natural uh, wildlife preserve at Ananda Nagar. It reflected Baba's love for the non-human creatures. And Baba started what he called the rational program, which amounted to all of us from around the world bringing literally hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of plants from our countries to India. They all went into Baba's garden where Baba would then tell their Latin name, their Greek name, their Sanskrit name, which animal was eating their ancestors millions of years ago, what diseases those plants can cure, and what benefits would come to another part of the world where those plants currently do not exist. One of the most important programs that was accomplished during this DMC was Baba's new plant distribution program. As a practical expression of his philosophy of neo-humanism, Baba has established a number of universal gardens where he is collecting all species of plants from all regions of the world. Daily, over 1,000 plants are received in Calcutta, and each one is carefully listed by Abhudhutika Ananda Karuna and labeled to be planted in one of Baba's eight gardens in India. In these gardens, there are now over 150,000 plants. In Baba's garden next to his house at Tiljala, Madhukorak, there are 60,000 plants. In this age of wanton environmental destruction, when many species of plants are disappearing, Baba's gardens are sanctuaries for rare plants to save many species on the verge of extinction. But now Baba has started a new program, not only preserving species of plants in his own garden, but distributing them to different socio-economic zones all over the world. Once uh, Baba was uh, just grafting one uh, rare uh, Murai exubitaka plant from Australia, the plant was very small. And by some, you know, due to some uh, uh, shaking, uh, what happened, that the grafting was uh, uh, done in, not in the proper way. The whole roots were cut, entire roots were cut. The plant was left without, with only root, uh, with only stalk. Baba became very sad that uh, this plant has been giving this much, you know, so, so much trouble. After that, he used to take report of the plant every hour, every half an hour. How is the plant? And it was Baba's miracle that uh, that plant survived. And today it has grown uh, to a very uh, healthy plant. It has grown a very healthy plant. Spirituality, so far as the spirituality is concerned, or the spiritual elevation is concerned, there is no difference between a monk or a family man, because it concerns only the mind. Between a woman and a man? A woman and a man, and a family man and a monk, there is no difference. A family man can also achieve moksha, a monk can also achieve moksha. Salvation. And there are numerous historical instances in which some of the uh, family men got moksha. And so also the monks also got moksha. So there is no, absolutely no difference so far as the spiritual aspect is concerned. Baba himself was a family man. In a life where we find so many major contributions, contributions in every sphere of human life, it is hard to single out just one contribution as the best, the most important. And yet, I cannot help but feel that Prabhat Sangeet takes pride of place. This is a truly extraordinary achievement. 5,018 songs, all given in the last eight years of Ananda Murtiji's life. That is easily more songs than any other single composer in recorded history. The music, the poetry, the imagery, the range of knowledge and spiritual inspiration contained in these songs are all on a level that is unparalleled.
over the course of my life and my time with Baba, I had different opinions about what were Baba's greatest contributions. At one time, I was sure it was Baba's 16 points, his Ananda Marga. And other times, and for a long time, I thought it was Prout. Uh, then came neo-humanism, and I became totally, totally immersed in, in the, the philosophy, the outlook, and thought, oh, how great this is. When Baba gave Prabhat Sangeet, I couldn't get into it. <laughs> I could not get into it. These were a lot of songs in Bengali with rhythms, uh, tals, that were somewhat foreign to me. It took me 30 years before I finally looked into Prabhat Sangeet, began to study it, get involved with it, and at this stage now, I'm convinced that Baba's greatest achievement was a collection of 5,000, more than 5,000 songs with such deep spiritual insight and such beautiful melodies and varying melodies, interesting melodies that raise Prabhat Sangeet into its own independent genre of music. There is not a subject on this earth over which he did not give some fresh thought and he didn't have to think about it. It was just spontaneous. Mm. Here in Anandagar, I went on a field walk with Baba and that day he had just been giving new songs. Mm -hmm. And Baba says, what do you think about Prabhat Sangeet? I said, Baba, it is a revolution in the field of music. He says, yes, you are right. It is a revolution in the field of music. He says, musical jurisprudence uh, requires that I should give it in one, uh, you know, language. But actually, the melodies are so diverse, they have been brought in from all parts of the world. Many of the melodies, the ragas, had become extinct. I have revived them. In the history of this world, I, I'm very confident that no one has come cl close to matching a body of music as large as 5,018 songs. So it's noteworthy in and of itself. And anyone can go on YouTube and listen to the music and at nowadays go on Sarkarverse and listen to the music and read the lyrics and understand that this is some amazing work. The first Prabhat Sangeet was given in Devagar. It is hardly about overnight journey by train. And it is Mount, it is a religious place, Shiva's place, Lord Sada Shiva, Shiva's place, Devaghar. So Baba's house quarter is also there, not like this, but uh, there is Baba's quarter, Baba in that quarter gave the first Prabhat Sangeet. Bandhu he niye chalo. This first, Bandhu he niye chalo. Oh my Lord, you, you take me with you. I am ready to go with you. Huh? Uh, take me to the from darkness to light. Oh my Lord, you take me with you to from this darkness to from this mundane world to supra mundane world. <laughs>
per dire un ballare il suo di di canotto la lettera se pare che sono a chiaga sono non si no a chiaga sono chiaga mi se pare che sono the four specialities that is vabo that is ideation bhasha that is sweet and uh, graceful language uh, Shuro, that is varieties of melodies, and Chando, that is rhythm, Prabhat Sangeet occupies a unique place or position in the world of music. And because of these three, because the four special qualities, uh, it can legitimately claim to be a distinct school of music. And I have no doubt in my mind that in the coming years, Prabhat Sangeet is going to be a very, very popular school of music uh, throughout the world. Prashanda, who has recorded all of Baba's songs on tape, how he feels singing Prabhat Sangeet. Actually, I can say that I'm the happiest person of the world at the moment, that I could sing songs for Baba. I consider myself blessed and fortunate, most fortunate. According to the rules set down by Baba, a three persons should be in his room when he's giving any new song. First of all, we enter his room and we do Sastanga Pranam and then Baba asks who are the persons present in the room. He wants to know the names of the persons and then he starts himself, sings the tune. Uh, I think he sings the tune of the songs uh, twice, twice. And after the singing, uh, singing the full tune, he asks us, actually he asks uh, whether the tune is good or not, whether it is, uh, the tune is uh, that, whether it is uh, that uh, some song can be given on this tune, whether we like this, that tune, particular tune or not. And when we actually approve of the tune, actually approve in the, in the very material sense, we <laughs> can't approve, uh, that we approve, uh, when we approve that uh, Baba, um, and say that Baba it is a very nice tune and uh, we must have some song in this tune. Then, then Baba gives the words immediately. He goes on singing with the words and with the tune together. And we note down the words of the song. And Baba goes very fast, very fast, you see. Sometimes we lose a, a, a lot of words because Baba moves so fast, both with the tune and the words, that you can't uh, actually keep pace with him. And uh, after singing the full song, Baba then asks to, uh, uh, that uh, we should sing the song. How far we have picked it up, then we sing the songs. I sing that particular song, three, and uh, Baba listens to it. And uh, sometimes, it, very often it happens that uh, he's not satisfied with the song, with our singing. Then he uh, again asks to sing the partic that, that very song. We again sing, and when and only when he's satisfied that we have picked up the song correctly, then only he says it's okay. You can now tip it for recording. That is the usual procedure. In the meantime, doctor was attending. Was telling Baba, Baba, don't give songs because song is you song. So you see, the pressure on the heart. You are thinking. Then Baba no, 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 he doesn't give me any pressure. Songs come automatically. I don't think anything. It comes automatically. And if I give a speech on uh, different languages, you know, or uh, different uh, sciences, you know, it comes automatically. I am not to talk. He knows Keshwanan, how much time I take to give a song? You know, four to five minutes. In early January of 1984, Baba began a road tour of India. Along the way, he gave new songs in every place he stopped and even by the roadside. And these songs, always relevant to where he was, with whom he was, would often go backward or forward in time. He would praise the qualities of historical figures who lived in the area or encourage latent qualities of the people living there now. He would sing about nature, the local flora and fauna, and even the rivers, plains, forests, and mountains. And through his words and melodies, the material world takes on deep spiritual significance. The road tour ended in early April, barely three months later. 
On that trip alone, along with all of his other duties, Baba gave more than 360 songs. Acharya Sarvatmananda Abhuta was the general secretary of Ananda Marga for 10 years, and he was a very effective administrator. Nowadays, he would only speak to me about Prabhat Sangeet, in respect to which he was privileged to have been on Baba's song team. In a way, it, is, it, is, it was unthinkable. It, that time, you know, it, how could it happen? We cannot imagine even that how in this situation, doing, while doing work, different type of mood, and then Baba is changing mood and giving beautiful Prabhat Sangeet. Beautiful. That time we could not uh, understand that this can be like this. But now, you know, in our raw voice we sang, you know. But now when we sing, see, listen to that they, the big, bigger, bigger uh, singers are singing, then we sometimes I feel and we also feel that we are the persons who are mediums and such a big, uh, high type of, you know, beautiful songs. You know? <laughs> unparalleled, really unparalleled. Yeah. In, in number and in quality and in diversity, it's amazing. And what to talk of inside his room. While Baba was in Kartu, yes. sometime he will, two, three months he will be there, and again went out in Kartu. So he started giving Prabhat Sangeet on road. You, you cannot imagine road. You know, highway. That is, Suppose Baba's car is moving to a highway. So, highway, you know, so many uh, vehicles are moving this side and that side. So, highway will be a little bigger yeah. in uh, breadth also. Breath also. So, Baba car, you know, we have a little car beside. Our right. car is not so, uh, you know, uh, fast. So, we will need uh, <laughs> You mean you had to drive parallel and to... We were. We were oh. to. <laughs> but every time it did not happen. So anyhow, after within five minutes, ten minutes maximum, we'd reach. So, uh, we see that Baba's PA or the bodyguard would be ready, you know, yes. to call us. Yes. They would be with Baba, one would be with Baba, so Baba, they'd be ready. Come, come. Call, call, Baba coming, Baba calling, Baba calling. So we saw, so ba once Baba just carries one side, uh -huh. little away from the road, and um, Baba's the side where Baba, which, which Baba was seated, that door was, car door was open. And uh, I, we immediately understand, understood that Baba would start giving. Sit there uh, inside the car, foot on the ground. All, all the outside. <laughs> <laughs> no question of going inside. <laughs> Before he gets And uh, somehow would sit, you know, even on the dust, you know. Mm. <laughs> or so suppose this knee portion would be on dust, one knee, you know. Somehow would take. But we have to, we have no other choice. Baba was giving Prabhupada Sangeet, we have to, our duty, by that we understood that we had to record. Mm. Had to write. And after, it started from the beginning, that uh, after uh, we sang before Baba, Baba would give, make corrections. Obviously Baba would make corrections, either word correction uh -huh. or melodies. And if we insist him to do it second time, then Baba would not like it. Mm. No, 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 one time it happened that no, they, they are not ready, so I have just started <laughs> prematurely, <laughs> so I shall not... Uh, this yes. song won't be given. <laughs> it won't be given. <laughs> Anyhow, so, but uh, uh, on the roadside, several times it happened. Just while you're moving to one place, Baba would stop the car and say, yeah, come. Yeah, yeah. Baba initially described Microvita as the mysterious emanation of cosmic factor. All that I understood was that Microvita are like a green screen. When you can control them, there's very little that you cannot do. You see, of course, some demonstration was done on me also. So demonstration means, spiritual demonstration means, suppose we are, we are doing meditation. So actually, what are the feelings when your mind comes to different chakras, different plexes? Or there are so many experiences Baba used to uh, uh, make experience you know, to our mortgage, I mean workers also. So we used to come every month and we used to enjoy at least for that week, very nice. Suppose uh, many di different type of emotions, uh, 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 his life can be converted to his life. 
but your personality can matter to his personality, his person can matter to your personality. You see, everything is play of your psycho spiritual and your uh, physical, physical, psychic and spiritual sphere. Suppose if you change your existence and we put in, in my existence and you so many experiences were there. I mean, Baba used to do and then you, how do you feel? Or suppose how, uh, many weeks and Baba go put your mind in uh, 100 years before, where were you? Usually Baba I am seeing a mountain or something like that, I am saying then Baba to guess, he was a great sage at that time. But there are many, many experiences of Baba used to make those up to 68, 69, up to 70. Then Baba was shifted to Raj, uh, Patna. And then of course so many things they came at that time the government was then they came against and Baba was arrested. Then during his discourse he told, today I would like to give a historical demonstration. He told, this demonstration was given by Lord Krishna to Arjun 3005 years back. That is demonstration of the visualization of the universal form, uh -huh. Vishwarup Darshan. So all margis got allotted because we had read in the Gita mm -hmm. how this Lord Krishna gave demonstration to Arjun on this Vishwarup Darshan. So all were at attention. So Baba told that uh, I will give this demonstration. So he took my name and he told that I should come forward and sit mm -hmm. in front of him. Mm -hmm. So accordingly, I came yes. nearer, to, closer to him yes. and I sat in front of him. Yes. Then Baba told me that I should concentrate my mind in Sahastra Chakra. Sahastra Chakra here. Then he touched my this eyebrow center, Agya Chakra, with his stick. And he gave me divine vision, a special vision. And then he told, let my mind should be deeply concentrated in the Sahastra Chakra. As Baba told, accordingly my mind was concentrated deeply into Sahastra Chakra. Then Baba told, as you have concentrated your mind in Sahastra Chakra, so you see what you are visualizing, what you are seeing, what do you feel. So the moment he told I should concentrate, my mind was deeply concentrated mm -hmm. in Sahastra Chakra. And after the moment, I started doing dhyan in Sahasra Chakra. So when I started doing the deep dhyan, then I had a strange type of experiences. Mm -hmm. I saw as Baba's physical body was dissolving, as his physical body was dying, dissolving. So I had a much fear because I had never had a, this type of experiences that his body is getting uh, dissolved. Yeah. The moment he told, don't get afraid, he still go more in deeper dhyan. Accountingly, I started doing dhyan and in my deeper dhyan, I saw what I saw actually, I started having a intense bliss mm -hmm. as my each and every pore of body was thrilling with the divine experiences and then I saw a white effulgent light floating on the head of over my Sahasra Chakra mm -hmm. and while seeing that white effulgent I felt as I was floating in the ocean of bliss. 
So Baba told, whatever you are visualizing, you should express your feeling in front of everybody. Then I told Baba, I am seeing on my Sahasra Chakra, there is a effulgent light. And while seeing that light, I am getting immense happiness, immense bliss. Then again he commanded for the second time, let I should still go more deeper in my dhyan. The moment Baba told that I should still go deeper in the dhyan, then my mind was completely absorbed in the deep dhyan. Then what I started seeing, that I was seeing effulgent light floating over my Sahasra Chakra. And over the light, what I saw, Baba was sitting in his divine form. What did that look like? Yeah. His body, though he was not in the body of the flesh and bone, mm -hmm. not in the physical body, though he had a physical appearance, but in the form of the divine effulgent. But he was sitting in the Bharabha Mudra. This was really fantastic, incredible. And while seeing that form, I started losing myself. So Baba told, what you are seeing, visualizing in Dhyan, that is the real form of Anand Murti. Anand Murti is a embodiment of bliss and he is a bodiless entity, he is a spiritual entity, he is a devotional entity, he is an additional entity. Anand Murti is not a physical body. So this is the real form of Anand Murti, he is a formless. Uh, towards, towards the year 1987, Baba started giving philosophical topics uh, practical topics, demonstrations that were so far outside of my realm of knowledge, my uh, so far outside of the historical traditions of Tantra and Tantric philosophy, that I was largely lost. One example of that was Baba's theory of prama, meaning dynamic equilibrium and equipoise, a way of moving with proper balance. We've always known that the, the way, the spiritual path, the ideal path is the middle way. Buddha, the Buddha said the same thing. but. Baba took that concept to a new level with his exposition of prama, dynamic, equilibrium, and equipoise. It also had relevance to the way in which politics is conducted, the way in which a, a government makes choices between conflicting possibilities. You can do one thing, but if you do that, you won't be able to do the other. And how do we balance things up and move society forward in a healthy fashion? We had simplistic understanding of this concept. Baba took it to a new level, demanding a type of perception that is inherently intuitive. And so, the concept was out there for us. Baba gave examples of the triangles of forces that we need to balance up for Prama, but I can say quite honestly that I didn't understand it. I can't implement it. Another good example of this is Baba's theory of microvita. The, the idea of microvita was given in 1986. Mm -hmm. And in the following four years, uh, Piyasaka gave uh, a good number of di discourses. So during the, the 90s, these discourses were uh, ventilated by, by a good number of intellectuals in the world. 
but they couldn't make really sense out of it. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the general people, they, they picked it up, they didn't understand it, and then they used the word microvita in an inflationary way, so that finally, by the end of the 90s, it became a joke. And people were making jokes about this very serious issue. Ah. So that was painful to see that uh, an approach which is so resourceful, which is so helpful, mostly to bridge the big gap between Eastern and Western thought, is uh, becoming useless by uh, being inflated and finally uh, joked. Trivialized or, me Trivialized, or yes. misunderstood so, yes. so deeply. So we, we were thinking, I was thinking mostly, my Acharya was also thinking, that we have to build a better base so that if people make a joke, that is fine and well and good, always laughing is fine, but uh, the basis should not be uh, trivialized, it should not be shaken by laughter, it should be solid. And that solid base we have made with mathematics. It was obvious from the very beginning that here we get something which will, at least in the future and also in all the way reaching to the future, uh, be parallel to what we what we like to see in science. Okay, well Western science doesn't accept the notion of even something as simple as homeopathic medicine because it's going beyond what you can see under the microscope. Right. Um, so my question here is uh, in a world where the mind is equated with the brain where the concept of a soul or is consciousness it? is almost lost. And this is the big problem of materialists right. in the West, right. that they, they cannot uh, explain these qualitative uh, concepts. Right. How is it that you, you think microvita, this theory, will help us to resolve that uh, dichotomy? Right. In the beginning it was only felt. Mm -hmm. I felt that this is a possibility. Right. Uh, in the next step, with my Acharya, I tried to understand what he writes, and then to assimilate it what into Baba my writes? yes, what what Baba writes exactly. His discourses mm -hmm. in these small booklets which we received. Yes. There were no books at that time, so we received every half year, approximately, we received these small, and we tried to understand what he says. Uh, then in the next step, we try to assimilate it and uh, to repeat what he said in the own language mm -hmm. and in, the, in, a, in a format which uh, would be understood by any scientist. Mm -hmm. That was the next step. And then slowly uh, a possibility uh, arose where we can put it in, in uh, mathematical forms. Mm -hmm. When that was completed, we realized that uh, we have a solution, but this solution is not understood by our audience. Then we had to find ways to bring the mathematical formulas or the math mathematical findings into allegories, into comparisons, into stories, uh, which are understood by everyone. I see. And have you done that at this stage? Yes, we have done it, and it is. But it is a process which continues. Okay. Uh, so uh, that process will continue. And Baba has said it is a science which will find its full blooming stage in 200 years. I see. So, so today you can say that it's not well accepted. It's not well accepted, but it is accepted by those people which I'm really counting on. Uh -huh. So it has been approved by a good number of mathematicians. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very happy to get approval from A standard mathematicians from Germany as well as from the United States. Yes. They have looked through it and they have approved it. So the basis, I find it is solid. And to find comparisons as well as applications, mm -hmm. that, is an, it, that is a long process. It, it will take really, let us say, 200 years and more. Okay. And we have no time pressure for that. And that is because this is a shift in paradigm on the very root of, on the very base of science. Right, it will transform cosmology, it, possibly yes. ontology, quite possibly. There is hardly any field which will not be transformed because uh, if you change the cosmology, 
if you change the basics of natural sciences, mm -hmm. if you change the basics of psychology and the understanding of mind and of spirit, then all the other applications, all the applied sciences will also change. Chemistry will change Certainly. because you, we yes. won't just talk about atoms and molecules, yes. we'll yes. also talk about yes. concentrations of microvita. Yes, because Baba says that microvite, uh, that uh, sorry, that atoms are basically not made out of elementary particles like we understand them now. Mm -hmm. There is a zoo of elementary particles, a whole lot of them, and they are the building blocks as we understand it now to form uh, what we call the phenomenal world, the, mm -hmm. the energies as well as the building blocks of matter. But he says that behind those building blocks there are microvita which are more fundamental than these elementary particles as we know them now. And uh, they are the real building blocks. They are the real agents which are uh, creating a link between the uh, what we call a consciousness and what we call a physical uh, world. Okay. Theoretically, would it be possible to build machines that could infuse microvita or could manipulate microvita within a, within a patient's body and somehow get a healing effect? That is a target. That is a target and that should be accomplished, certainly. Mm -hmm. But it is uh, futuri futuristic. Yeah, we cannot uh, give details nowadays. We can give details and this is our main field how to make out of a, uh, a natural person a good person. Okay. And in that field, when, when the microvita are activated, when they are infused or when they are um, activated and, and, and playing on the mental ground, uh, then we can see the results already now. That is our main field and that is what I can use because I do uh, meditation practice and I see how microvita are helping to deepen the concentration, to deepen the contemplation, and even to deepen um, the process of merging with something which is beyond myself. Mm -hmm. It is very clear, and it was known to the ancient uh, uh, wise people, mm -hmm. that we cannot do everything with our own wish and whim. We, we, there are some situations when we need uh, divine help mm -hmm. and that divine help is provided by the Through divine the itself or by his agents. By his agents. His agents are also supplying and providing that divine help which is badly needed in order to increase our, uh, the deepness of our sangha. So you also perceive microvita as divine agents? Yes, they are the divine agents which help to create everything and especially uh, to create our mind and our, the content of our mind. When you say to create everything, you mean even to create the, the whole cosmos? Yes. I mean, he says, Baba says, that even the atom is not made of elementary particles, but it is made of microvita. So that class of microvita, we call them physical microvita, these microvita, they are creating the physical world. And then there are the psychic microvita, they are creating our psychic world. And then there are the suprapsychic microvita, and they are creating that link with the suprapsychic um, arena. But these er physical microvita, are they also carbonic or non carbonic? No, they are completely non carbonic. Completely non carbonic. Completely. They are organizing whatever is carbonic, but they are on another level of existence which cannot easy, easily be um, uh, grasped. Can't uh, be seen. They, usually they cannot be seen. The positive microvite, application of positive microvite through planes of different inferences applied on different planes of propensities. On physical and psychic human body. Do you follow? It is not a miracle, it is the practical side of what I said 
during the speech, Renaissance speech. Baba's teachings, even the old ones, were ever new. But these latter teachings were new on a far different scale. The earlier teachings were somehow comprehensible to me. But the new ones, Prama, dynamic equilibrium and equipoise involving triangles of forces, Microvita, the primal and most subtle building blocks of our universe, a multiverse theory involving more than one Brahma, or God, and so on, these were totally path-breaking topics, and they mostly flew above my head. In some ways, it seemed to me like my Baba had moved on. In addition to the futuristic philosophy that Baba had begun giving, there were many other signs that Baba would be leaving soon. For example, Baba adopted a son. That was explained to us as being necessary because his biological son had left along with Baba's wife, the boy's mother, soon after Baba was arrested. As we were told, when Baba would die, then all of the property that was nominally in Baba's name, mostly houses where he stayed, would, according to Indian law, be inherited by the biological son if there, was, if there was no adopted one. In other words, the duty of the adopted son was only to preserve the mission's property. He in no way inherited any of Baba's spiritual authority. But the one thing no one in Anandamarga suspected was that Baba might be leaving us soon. There were other signs, at least for me, but I never put two and two together. Suddenly, in the middle of 1990, Didi Ananda Bharati, the head of our women's welfare department, she died. Medically, it was no surprise, but I had been certain that she would remain with us like a mother until Baba's departure. Again, I just did not think deeply. On top of all that, Baba was having multiple heart attacks and not taking the type of rest normally required for preserving life. But that fact also I ignored. As I've said, no one in Anandamarga, including myself, foresaw Baba's imminent death. Newspaper reporters could see it, but our eyes were blinded by an early myth that Baba would remain with us until the year 2005. Only with the benefit of hindsight do we now understand that it is nearly 2020 and he is still with us. Baba had often instructed us that the ideal person will not just die while working, but also work while dying. And if anyone ever set an example of that, it was Baba. Up to the very last minute, he was engaged in his routine duties. So, in 89, in the month of August perhaps, the first he was sick in December. Uh, all of a sudden, he got some heart problem. So we called the doctor. Doctor admitted him to hospital. Big hospital. We were there. Then he anyhow the doctor allowed me as a PA to be here with all the times with Baba. Then Baba, after few days, about about twenty days, became all right. Baba was released. He came here. After um, it was December month, first January, Baba was released from the hospital. Then again in the month of August, Baba became sick. Actually, when he was sick, Baba was admitted. There was a nursing home, Woodland nursing home, and then he was brought back to Lay Garden. And he was uh, recuperating there. And <clears throat> some of the margis in the government, they asked that, we should get Baba treated in Germany or overseas, America for good treatment. So, 
I was asked uh, uh, by there by the organization general secretary to go to Delhi to get his passport prepared. Then Bawas was not ready to go to outside. He was always prohibiting it. But later on, after pressure from the work organization, he permitted me to go to Delhi and get his passport ready. In the meantime, when I was coming, Baba left. Baba left with the passport we came, everything. And then, then all were surprised. He, he, before leaving, he has already conveyed his mission, message to all of us. Have I completed all my duty on this earth or not? Everybody told him, yes, Baba, you have completed. When I went there, I, Baba Quarter, I was just talking. In the meantime, there was the bell. Then I went inside the room. Just I was entering the room and that worker was going out of the room. Then I saw that Baba is, because two times I had already seen Baba some problem. I understood, and doctor suggested some sorbitrate, sorbitrate medicine. You keep near him, then immediately give. I just immediately put in his mouth. And then Baba, then we could call him Baba doctor. And there were two, three doctors here, Margie doctor. Immediately they came, within one minute. And they started uh, aspiration. As per they started treatment, no? But uh, it did not work. Maybe his determination. <laughs> so here we call it his determination of the cosmic will. Um, suppose in physical body, physical form, tomorrow if I am leaving this body, what will be difference? And you don't say about all this. You can't leave us. No, no, no. This is natural. When I have taken this, this uh, uh, body, I have to leave this body. It's natural. Everybody, one who comes, who goes. You know so. I thought that uh, Baba, the only difference maybe today you are any mortgage is coming to you and uh, their problem is solved. Tomorrow if you are not there, you will be solving. I do not know how you will solve. Then Baba laughed. Yeah, yeah, that will be the only difference. He came on this earth. He was not an ordinary human being. Mm -hmm. He was uh, the embodiment of all that there is, mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, in this universe. And he lived in a frail body, but actually uh, uh, there was nothing hidden. But the thing is, I used to die for him, you know, longing, so much of longing. I had pain in my heart. And Baba said, you embrace me and the pain will go. When I embrace the pain, will be not there. But when his heart's come up, I had so much of attraction for Baba. I used to wait for Baba. And Baba used to oblige everything, you know, like a friend he used to. But when the faces changed, different faces came, then uh, he used to tell me, you have to find your Baba inside, you have to know outside. What's happening to him, to, you know, never depressed, always cheerful, always um, full of love for everybody and trying to help everybody to evolve, you know. He was a very, very special person. There's nobody in this world like that. What is the greatest thing that Baba gave to me? and? And okay, one of my answers is that that nothing is impossible. That if if we believe in something to the core of our being, that that will happen, that will manifest. And he he radiated, and whenever he like. We used to go and give report to him about our work and in, in so many ways he would always not only encourage like, oh, you can do it, but, you know, he would ask us to do the impossible in a way, but in a way that we had to say, yes, we can do it. And when you say yes, 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 and keep on saying yes, then you, you can do it. No, and you learn how to do it. You you learn how to believe you can do the impossible, and you learn to do the impossible. When I do meditation, I find his glimpse, consoling me, not to worry. I am with you. So I feel now that he is always with me.
So this is the feeling at present I am. With this feeling, I am going on doing my uh, job, my duty, my, and feel that by doing little service to the suffering people, he is smiling. And his, his smile keeps me satisfied. Yes, let me do some, something to keep my Lord smiling. Baba should shower always his grace and blessing on all of you. While in prison, Baba declared his mission to me. Lying emaciated on a prison cot, having fasted for nearly five years, his wife and son having left him, and his organization banned, Baba said, I want to see sufficient change in every sphere of human existence while I am still in physical form. History will be the judge as to whether he succeeded. In 1990, on October 21st, Baba discarded his physical body. On October 26th, that body was cremated at our Tiljala compound in Calcutta. The ashes were distributed around the world. Oti Tumi Ikaki Eshi Chara Rati Roshi Shi Dua Rama Bandho Dekhi Dari Eshi Re Pathe Ri Pashe Thank you. 